Jonah, if we had to get a uncut gems moment, what should that uncut gems moment be with we you? We need for this, this episode to go viral. If we want this podcast and this episode to go viral, how do we pull it off? It's too late now, but okay. you should have asked me some really controversial question and got me to slip up and say something that would, you know, well, you're welcome. get me get me like canceled or fired or some, you know, in some way. Well, we do love your slamming salmon shirt. We got to say. All right. Thank you. 15 years before this song, two boys from the Northeast met in the dorm. They had an idea to cause a cultural storm. It's the best one yet, but the best is the norm. Jack, Nick, that's it. I don't even think they need to practice. 50%, that's a fat tip. T-Boy City on your at list. If you know, you know, cause we ready to go. We can't wait no more. So just start the show. Start the show. Yetis, our guest today, invented virality. Besties, he mastered the meme before gifts were a thing. He co-founded two industry-changing startups. And he turned down an acquisition offer from Disney. A guy who can pull off a cardigan and a hoodie on the same day. A guy who was born on New Year's Day. This entrepreneur's first job was teaching in New Orleans. His sister is a comedian actress on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He turned a side hustle into a billion-dollar brand. And then he turned that unicorn public in the middle of the pandemic. Jack, he'll ask you 10 questions and then he'll tell you which (laughs) Disney princess you are. But he'll also send a hard-hitting journalist to the halls of Congress. Yetis, our guest today is the founder and CEO of BuzzFeed. Our guest today is Jonah Peretti. This is Nick. This is Jack. And today's interview is the best one yet. It's a T-boy. Yetis, we are recording from our T-Boy studios at Shack 15 in the Ferry Building of San Francisco, overlooking the beautiful bay. Jonah, your two companies changed the media industry, and we followed your career closely. We're very excited to ask you questions. Thank you for coming. And so what Jack and I want to do is we want to figure out what the takeaway is on you and BuzzFeed. But to start, we really want to know, as the creator of BuzzFeed, how do you describe the company? I mean, first of all, it's very weird hearing your voice in real time <laughs> instead of at 1.2 speed. Yeah, um, it's like it? everything is in slow motion now. <laughs> um, BuzzFeed is a company I started uh, over 15 years ago where we were just trying to understand early on what was going to happen when the media industry was completely defined by what people share with each other, how people engage with content, um, and not by what an executive decides to put on the front page of a newspaper or a a TV show. Um, So the internet just completely changed the way the media industry works. What year was BuzzFeed founded? A long time ago. A long time ago. Well, we've actually heard your story and our favorite part of the founding story goes back to 2001. It does. It involves uh, kind of a prank, really. Um, A customized Nike shoe and something that Nike really hated. It began with a prank in Nike. (laughs) Is how BuzzFeed began in many ways. Do you mind telling us the the fantastic shoe story? Sure. So uh, I was in grad school at the MIT Media Lab. And like most grad students, I was procrastinating writing my master's thesis. And so I was sitting there looking for something to to entertain myself. And Nike had just launched something called Nike ID, where you could customize your shoes with a word or a phrase. And so I was kind of interested in it. So first I tried, you know, a four-letter word and it wouldn't accept it. And then I um, put in the word sweatshop and it accepted it. The S and, word. Yes. So, <laughs> so, so, um, I got this confirmation that they were going to send me a pair of Nike shoes with the word sweatshop under the swoosh. And so I was waiting. And then the next day I got an email from a Nike customer service rep who said the word sweatshop is inappropriate slang and they wouldn't send me the shoes. So I wrote back and I said, no, sweatshop means a, a, a factory where workers toil under unhealthy conditions. <laughs> it's in the dictionary. Yeah. And then they wrote back another excuse. And so this was perfect for me procrastinating because I was just spending the day writing back and forth with this this Nike Nike customer service rep. And probably executive. Yes, no. (laughs) They were concerned. (laughs) And so we, uh, uh, at the end of it, they just said, we reserve the right to not send you shoes with the word sweatshop on it. And I said, fine, I understand. But can you at least send me a picture of the 10 year old Vietnamese girl who stitches the shoes together? And then they didn't write back after that. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough and so this was January of 2001, before YouTube, before Facebook, before things went viral on the internet. And so nobody really thought about making something go viral. Now any weird thing happens, you're like, oh, put it on the internet, maybe it'll go viral. And so, um, but there were these things called email forwards back in the early days of viral media where people would forward something to their entire address book. And My Aunt Dot still does that today. So I sent it to about 12 friends and then they 
passed it on to their friends and they passed it on to their friends. And I started getting thousands of emails back from strangers, which in those days was weird. Now people interact with strangers on the internet all the time. But right. in those days, a stranger is writing you. You're like, right. whoa, what, what's going on? <laughs> Um, and then reporters started calling me. Um, I ended up on the Today Show with Nike's head of global PR and Katie Couric interviewing us about sweatshop labor, which I knew nothing about. I was just doing this prank. You're a grad student at the time. And I was I was a grad student. I had never been on TV. I was wearing this like poorly tailored blazer, just like, you know, nervously <laughs> going through an interview uh, with a communications pro from Nike. Yeah. With your webcam like strapped on your computer. <laughs> <laughs> no, they flew me to New York. What? Yeah, Very nice. Yeah, 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 they put me up in a hotel. That's so how media used to work. It was a full body video That's experience. How... It wasn't just upper body. Oh, yeah. I was sitting on the couch yourself. with Katie. After this experience, I'm sitting there thinking, how, how, why am I here? When there's, I met all these people who are fighting for human rights and knew, yeah. know all about this issue. And yet, because I made something viral on the internet, I end up you know, on the number one morning show and with articles in the New York Times and I started to think about how media was changing, where people sharing with other people and concepts like six degrees of separation mm -hmm. and small world actually matter matter when the internet connects everyone together and it's possible to reach millions of people just by telling a few people about something that they think is worth passing on to others. Mm -hmm. Okay, so most people would have been satisfied with like the 15 seconds of fame, but then you start honing in on like what is virality and this idea of like people as distribution, not yes. just the networks. If you can understand the psychology and the social psychology of why someone shares something, you can reach millions of people across the world. Even if you're a grad student without any connections in media, without any resources. And so we built BuzzFeed with this insight that media was going to be defined by people sharing with each other. And we grew along with you know, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and other platforms that that benefited from this major shift of media becoming more democratized and people sharing with other people, a more peer-to-peer -peer kind of model. So after grad school, you graduate and then you go on to co-found the Huffington Post and then you start BuzzFeed as a side hustle, but it eventually becomes a full hustle. So we think of you as the inventor of virality based on that story and then the trajectory of the rest of your career. What do you think of that? I think that um, there were so many people that I met in those early days mm -hmm. who accidentally made something go viral. But there were a few of us who, who tried to really understand ah. it and to not just say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, this weird accident happened where I posted a bunch of audio clips of my ex-girlfriend yelling at me and it went viral or I made the dancing baby. So you believe that it's not just pure luck or in some cases it may be, but you can really kind of tailor a formula and crack the code of virality? Like the way Jack and I were, were framing this before, we were wondering, is virality a science or is it serendipity? Like, can virality be engineered or must it be organic? Where does it fit? I think it's an art and a science. And you definitely, um, it, you, could, you definitely can increase your chances of making something uh, spread. We, we also, um, with our, my science advisor, Duncan Watts, we published this paper on big seed marketing, which is that even if you don't make something go viral, if you make people share it a little bit, that still gives you extra and gives you extra value. So if, if you're an advertiser, one of the reasons that advertisers like working um, with us is if you make something good, you might pay, you know, a million dollars to reach a certain size audience. And then you get another 500,000 for free as people start to share yeah. the, mm -hmm. con you know, the, the content. It doesn't have to even be super viral for mm -hmm. it to give you extra, extra benefit. It's frustrating to hear that you can crack the code because- I know what you're thinking. I know you're going to share. Well, we had a, our best TikTok ever a couple weeks ago and we got 200,000 views. We celebrated the wins. Huge win for us. You know, we're early in our TikTok journey. We looked at all the characteristics of that video and reproduced it like in a perfect format for the next day. But with a different story, we tried to engineer the virality a second time. We pushed publish. We got seven views. <laughs> it was a difference. And it was kind of depressing because it, it, it seemed like TikTok forgot to push the like viral button or something. Yeah, it's hard to reproduce things. And part of the reason it's hard is because novelty is one of the things that causes something to go viral. And so if you copy the thing you did previously, that can actually hurt the chances of going viral because it's not new. And so there's this yeah. weird uh, interplay of what's new and different and and what is the 
abstract underlying principles that could sort of help we have, something go. We go have out. seen some. Those are the TikTok stars, right? And that's kind of the category we're in is kind of this creator category. Is it the same for brands? Is there a difference between the virality of brands versus humans? Well, I think a lot of it depends on the medium and the type of content you're making. So podcasts, are, are for example, are a very good medium to build loyalty and, and deeper connection. Mm -hmm. So usually less viral um, because yep. it's, it, it, you know, a TikTok you can watch in 40 seconds, 20 seconds, pass it on to your friend. It, it's it's a, not a big commitment. Listening to a podcast, yeah. it's a bigger commitment. It's harder to share. Yeah, it's harder to share. But the people who listen, if they're listening every day or they're listening frequently, they start getting much more invested. And so you can build a lot more loyalty. So a lot of what we learned over the years is that as, as the, you know, market evolved and the industry evolved is that you have to continually update and change your models for how you think about how something goes viral and what your goals are. It might be in some cases you want to go, you want something to go viral. In other cases, you want more loyalty and people to get more invested and you want the same people to get a better experience and be, be more, more deeply connected. Um, but in all of it, it's really this two-way connection with the audience that, that the internet enables that you just didn't have in traditional media. I suppose without the internet, we could have launched a radio show. That's true. It would have been radio. We would have had to pick a, a local city, though. And we would have had to have more sound effects. And get sponsored by the local car dealership. It would have been a different experience. <laughs> <laughs> we actually believe with our show that humor is something that transcends gender and races and can bring people together, kind of like food can bring to well people together. Well put, Jack. Yes. Um, and so much of what does go viral and what gets clicks and what my wife shares with me that she found on BuzzFeed is the funny stuff. You must understand humor. Can you tell us like why is humor and virality so often linked together? If you think about what matters to people, it hasn't changed much in the last few thousand years. Um, it, you know, technology has changed a lot every, every, you know, decade. There's so many new technologies, but people still want to hang out with their friends. They want to laugh with their friends. They want to be informed. They want to, you know, cook a nice meal for, for someone they love. Mm -hmm. So we look at these deeper human needs and then we say, okay, all this, all this technology is changing. So we have to adapt the way we make our content and the way we do it. But the, the thing that doesn't change is people and human behavior. And I think laughter is a fundamental thing that brings people together. Kind of like food, which is also another category. We see a lot of content on the internet, mm -hmm. viral content. Um, kind of like cute kittens and animals yeah. and children doing funny things. It's like these things that bring out our humanity and our deeper uh, connection connection with each other. Jack and I were, were looking back on early BuzzFeed days and we've seen virality change over time because it did kind of begin with those cat videos you're describing, Jack. Well, of course, of course, virality can, can be problematic. I mean, when you remove the editor or the executive, as you said, who decides what's on the front page of the newspaper, then it's possible that facts get thrown by the wayside and misinformation spreads. What's to be done about this? Like, yeah, I think a lot of the, the early um, viral content was done by pretty idealistic people who yeah. were making, wanting to make people laugh, wanted to you know, spread heartwarming content. And more recently, it's really become part of a larger culture war where you have people who are, mm. you know, trying to create a fascist state spreading <laughs> or, uh, you know, a white nationalist, <laughs> you know, are trying to figure out how to go viral, right? So um, I think it, it, the, the attempt to try to understand this, the power of making things on the internet that deeply connect with audiences that people share that can reach big, big audiences and influence people and their lives has become a battleground. And so the platforms are now all really struggling with this challenge where, you know, they, they want to have an algorithm that shows people the most engaging content, but sometimes the most engaging content is, um, you know, the wrong content. Yeah. Factually incorrect <laughs> or racist or harassing someone or using, you know, taking the majority group's perspective to attack a minority and people are, are sharing it. And, and the platforms are trying to make a environment where all these different types of people can, can live together in harmony and peace. And <laughs> instead it's become this, this battleground. And that's a huge part of our mission of spreading truth and joy on the internet, where you can use the power of the internet and the two-way connection with the audience and the fact that people can share content with each other and engage more deeply, but you can do it with quality journalism, accurate facts, things that have yeah. a positive message, mm -hmm. things that make people laugh in a, you know, in a way that is not about, you know, uh, attacking a, a weak group or kicking down or th things like that. You must have been in, you know, conversations with the executives of the social media companies. Did they know back then um, 
that they would have this content policing responsibility in the future? Do they have any idea kind of uh, the responsibilities they would have as content moderators? For the most part, no. Either there was a naive view that they Mm -hmm. were making the world a better place no matter what, and that more people sharing, more voices would would lead inherently to a better, more democratic world. Um, And and that view turned out to be um, myopic. Uh There, there was, there's a lot of bad actors who can make a lot of noise and do a lot of damage um, if they start to understand these viral mechanisms. Um, And then I think some of them thought, well, that will be government or that will be, you know, other people's problem. We're just a platform. We're just the internet and people can do whatever they want and bad things happen in the real world and bad things happen on the internet. And that's just sort of how it is. You know, we mentioned you're the inventor of virality, or at least we think that. Like, what's your favorite listicle BuzzFeed's ever published? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, an old school one called uh, 13 Things to Get You Through a Rough Day. <laughs> and that one I, I, I really liked because it, you know, it would be like, look at this ostrich chasing this guy, you know, yeah. or look at this cute, you know, kitten. Or it was like a combination of someone having a worse day than you and then cute, heartwarming things. And I, I liked it because it it was a good example of how we thought about content, especially in the early days where it's not always about the information. Mm-hmm. It's about how it makes you feel and the role that it plays in your social life. And so making content that is designed to share t- with your friend who's having a bad day mm-hmm. to cheer that person up is it's doing a job in someone's life that is different than just, you know, putting information in their head. And so that was something the social web really, really opened up. What's something about BuzzFeed, the company, that may surprise our listeners? I mean, I think the biggest thing that surprises people is they think of BuzzFeed and and maybe they think of whatever piece of the company they've touched. Like they might think of the lists or, mm. you know, quizzes if they've been to our website. They might think of some of our videos if they, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, but BuzzFeed Inc. is a much bigger company. And so people sometimes are surprised that we, um, that Tasty is part of BuzzFeed and that we have this, this food brand. Um, people sometimes don't know that HuffPost is part of BuzzFeed Inc., or that Complex, um, you know, and Complex Con, the big festival every year in in, in Long Beach uh, for sneakers and music and food, that that's part of BuzzFeed Inc. Um, or that the the Hot Ones show, uh, you know, uh, or Pizza Wars or some some of these other um, mm. you know amazing uh, shows and series are are part of what we do. So you're naming now like a real variety of media products. So how do you guys go about creating? these shows? Is there a room? Is there a place where like all the brains get together? What's the content process like to create something like this? Is there a writer's room? I think one of the things that that we've learned is that small groups of people are often the best at coming up with new ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, so one Not part, by committee. Yeah. One person, one person is maybe a little lonely. Two people, you know, yeah. you, you riff off each other and right. you come up with a lot of ideas that way. Um, but, but a small group of people, you know, two to seven people, you know, in a room, brainstorming, talking about ideas, also looking at other things and getting sources of inspiration. Like what other, you know, what video was created on the, you know, uh, by some other company or creator that you're jealous of, where you look at it and you're like, oh, that was really creative. And then it's not like you want to copy that, but you want to think like, how could we do something that cool? Or how can we do something, you know, that, that pushes the, the, the envelope or, or, you know, goes in a new direction. And so it's a combination of, 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 you know, consuming stuff and, and brainstorming with people and and not trying to have, you know, a massive meeting with half the company trying to come up with things. And then we see a lot from the audience and that inspires us. You know, I think of it almost like live music performance where a musician performs and the crowd is giving them energy. On the internet, you make content and the crowd gives you energy and sometimes they're <laughs> booing and throwing tomatoes and sometimes they're cheering and, and they sometimes will ask for something like, oh, I love this. Could you, you know, like with Hot Ones, there's, constant requests for guests where people are commenting like, mm. oh, could I have this guest? Or with the BuzzFeed famous puppy interviews where we have, <laughs> you know, uh, like, you know, huge stars coming and getting interviewed while they're p- petting puppies. You know, the, the, the audience is always like, I want Chris Evans. Yeah. Could Chris Evans like do it? You know, and then he does do it because he sees the audience wants yeah. him and, and, and then it becomes, you know, a moment on the internet. When you're describing the creation of these shows, at what point do you know You have it. That's a franchise. We've got something here. Because some of these shows, you've tried them and they failed and they haven't worked. So what? where do you like figure out, you know what? We're really onto something here. 
and like you want to expand it. Yeah, I mean, that's why you need to have conviction and not just follow data because sometimes you have a good idea and then it just fails in the execution or it doesn't get made quite the right way or doesn't get pushed to the right place for distribution. And you have to not say, okay, now we're just giving up on it and it was a bad idea. Um, and, and, and so um, it's always this combination of creativity and conviction as, as well as like looking at data, looking at audiences. And I think it varies by, by which group within our company. You know, it's, I think complex is, goes more on gut because complex is a lot about what's about to be big not what's big right now. Whereas BuzzFeed's more pop culture, what's trending right now, what's getting big at this uh, exact moment. I'd like to ask, you know, to get back to the puppy question. I knew you were going to go back what, to the puppy. What is BuzzFeed's profit puppy? Yes. The thing that makes you the most money. I would say our commerce business. Oh yeah? Affiliate links? So it's a smaller business and a newer emerging business, but it's very high margin. So people love to shop on BuzzFeed. So if you Google BuzzFeed shopping, you'll see... There's all kinds of great articles and posts and lists about things you might want to buy and um, and people best Father's it, Day gifts kind of thing yeah stuff like stuff stuff like that um, you know 23 genius inventions you never knew existed mm -hmm. and you you know you just it, it's more like um, shopping in a in a mall or a promenade or a cool shopping district where you yeah. discover new things you didn't even know you wanted and and so that's um, part of it on the Tasty app you can do grocery shopping. So if you, you can just ah. click a button and it'll put all the ingredients for the recipe into your into, shoppable into a basket. recipes. And so then you're yes, getting a order. commission from we like get a, a commission delivery on app? that. And we okay. get a commission when people shop off BuzzFeed. And then at ComplexCon, people are buying drops and sneakers and fashion and, and shopping shopping there. Um, oh, and then back to Tasty, we have we have a hundred plus SKU line of cookware at every Walmart in North America <laughs> in the bright, tasty colors. And so when people um, are watching tasty videos, they see our pots and pans, and then when they're at Walmart, they're like, oh, I can buy that and use it in my own kitchen. I love the one pot recipes. Um, you've mentioned before in one of your interviews that media companies, in your opinion, don't do a great job kind of getting credit for the value that they're producing and the value that's received by the consumer of the content. Um, it actually sounds like you're doing a great job with your commerce business, sort of getting a little credit or getting a little commission for brilliant shopping ideas that you inspire. But can you tell us about media companies that are missing opportunities to monetize? Yeah, so in our commerce business, we're, we know we're driving hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions and we're getting a percentage uh, commission on that. But we may be driving another several hundred million dollars in transactions that we're not getting credit for. We probably, probably... Even because there's way no more than that. link there? Well, so think about it this way. You go, to, um, you go to BuzzFeed and it's like, you know... 12 bucket list destinations you should travel to, you know, and you get inspired to go to the Grand Canyon and then you buy a ticket and you do this and you do that. You know, we don't get, we don't get a cut of that, but the airline makes money. The car rental company makes money. trying to get a cut of that? Um, it's hard. It, it's hard. Like yeah. media companies inspire people by showing them cool things they should do and things they should try. And then these other companies profit off of it. Mm -hmm. And and so if uh, media companies could get a, a small small little sliver of the of, of the activity they're inspiring that could fund way more entertainment news journalism all kinds of great content it's almost like physics like this the trip would not have happened if it were not for that buzzfeed article inspiring the trip to the grand canyon that actually sounds like a gmac question exactly and then buzzfeed <laughs> makes it happen but yet gets a disproportionately smaller percentage of what you end up spending to go on that trip Yes. Then if I'm an investor in BuzzFeed and I'm wondering, okay, how can you capture more of that value? What would be your groundwork, your plan? Um, it's um, really working on the attribution where you inspire people and in the moment they click through and transact. So so getting good at um, at, at really building- Frictionless yeah, frictionless bridges. so that they don't they don't say, oh, okay, now I, re now I wanna go do this transact. I wanna go to the Grand Canyon. And oh look, I can click here and get a you know discount um, travel voucher that I could use on you know a, a provider. Like we've done some experiments with that. Yeah, you know, and Buzz I think there's travel. a lot I, of opportunity. I bet you there's the a Buzzfeed travel folder on this computer somewhere. Oh, yeah, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere. Um, Jonah's got it. Now speaking of like missed monetization opportunities, I, I want to just talk about TikTok generally because Nick and I are creators. Uh, the podcast being the primary creation and. So much TikTok creation goes unmonetized. Um, we looked at your latest earnings recall and we control F'd it 
and we found short form vertical video mentioned nine times. Short form vertical video mentioned nine times. The old times. SFVV. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> is BuzzFeed making money on its robust TikTok ventures? We're making some money on it. We have a product called Upshots that allows an advertiser to get a branded version of a vertical video that can run on TikTok, Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts. Um, YouTube just announced a new program where they're going to start sharing revenue with um, on shorts. In, w- on shorts. Um, do you think you know, TikTok will do that? I know TikTok has in China on some in some of their apps there, and so uh, you know, and they've done some experiments with these creator funds and things like that. I think TikTok is very focused on just trying to kill all the other social media companies and take <laughs> yeah. share and get as big as possible. And and now they're starting to focus on monetization along with. Um, you know, YouTube and Facebook focusing on monetizing these new vertical formats. Nick and I are in the business of news and we love kind of packaging our news into a a fun, digestible, once a day, first thing in the morning, um, 15 minute package. It is a passion of ours to inform people in a fun and entertaining way. Is BuzzFeed News a passion project for you? We started out with virality as being the, the, the way to reach everyone in the world. But once you've reached a big audience, then the question is, well, who, who are you going to um, build a deeper relationship with that you, you know, can have consuming your content every day? And- you're, you're radiating joy to me. Like, <laughs> I just sense that you love creating things and putting them on the internet. And when someone reads an article and, and shares it with their buddy because it's funny, I could tell that brings you great satisfaction. And it's because you've ignited joy in someone. Um, and I think that's the mission statement of BuzzFeed, right? BuzzFeed News is less about joy and more about just like informing, right? Um, well, I think one of the, the challenges that every media company faces is that the world changes and you have to change along with the world. And so I think we all remember the bright, shiny Obama era millennial, uh, you know, re- uh, period of joy and puppies and avocado toasts and <laughs> You know, they were great times. And, still joyous. <laughs> great feelings right now. It's fantastic. And then, and then it's kind of like we we're all trapped inside, and the air is not breathable. At least in California, <laughs> with the wire wildfires, the and there's yeah. like very different kind of president. You know, yeah. who who you know, whatever you think of Trump, the feeling of um of kind of utopian, peaceful, happy, smile, friendly was was like really disrupted both you know politically and socially and. Um, with with various things in the world, right? And so I think people do come for, to us for joy and for escape, but they also come to us because they want to know what fucked up thing just happened in the world <laughs> um, and what is mean, it, how Buzz, is it going to affect them? BuzzFeed News won a Pulitzer, right? Yes, we did. Yeah. And did, did that boost uh, like, you know, NPS rankings or people's uh, or BuzzFeed's reputation and its its love out there in the world? Did you get credit for that from a business sense? And do you want credit for that? Like, do you want public affirmation on these efforts, or do you? Is it not um, I mean, I think it's 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 great for reporters to know that they can come to BuzzFeed and do Pulitzer level work. And so, from a talent standpoint, mm-hmm. I think it's really um, you know powerful that that sort of as an employment brand. Then, how do you get credibility with the users, not just within the industry? Yeah, I mean, BuzzFeed News looks uh, you know is is really the the leading you know news source that women read, young women read, and serving and writing about things that matter to them and that they care about. I mean, it's not, certainly it's not a brand only focused on, on you know, on serving women, but it is, uh, the audience is, is, is skewed in that direction. And we write about things that really matter, uh, you know, reproductive rights and, um, you know, sexual assault on campuses and things that things that um, the audience really cares about. So I think the way you build brands today is less about talking up your brand and saying we won this award or or buying ads to explain why your brand is great. And it's more about showing up and providing service to the reader where they see, wow, this 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 news organization cares about me understands me, is on my side, is fighting for me, and is doing, you know, really great work um, that that um, that speaks to me. You know, really, BuzzFeed created the sponsored, the native ad, the sponsored post. How did BuzzFeed strike the balance with its native? I mean, I just feel a little uncomfortable having paid $20,000 for this interview. And now, <laughs> now you're saying... You're, we you're struck just, it from the... It you're was just totally lying off the to the audience saying that this is like a, a, normal, a normal... I thought we are on the same page on this. <laughs> um, no, I, I get what you're saying. And when we started BuzzFeed, um, you, 
you know, you couldn't really make money making popular content on the Facebook platform. Facebook didn't have an ad model and they didn't really share anything. And so we would try to find alignment with brands. Like an early example was when Game of Thrones was coming out, HBO wanted us to help launch Game of Thrones. And so we did a quiz, how will you die at Game of Thrones? And, and it I was like, the die part. That yeah, was perfect. You know. that's the native ad. That's- so you'd answer these questions and it was like, you'll be ripped to shreds by a dire wolf or you'll be beheaded, you know, <laughs> by a white walker or whatever. I don't think they had white walkers at that point, but, but, <laughs> but anyway, the, you know, and then the byline was HBO. Brilliant. So it was like, it was clear that it was, that it was, you know, HBO, but that actually made the content better because, you know, a quiz by HBO, you know, about, Game of Thrones is kind of kind of cool. So, so sometimes it can be a good alignment, and and I think you just label it clearly, and people people understand it. You know, it, had we had a model like early, you know, or like cable television with affiliate and advertising, we probably wouldn't have messed around with that because you'd have this built-in monetization that'd be great. Early social, you know, content didn't really have it, just like early content didn't. So I think native advertising is really powerful when a platform is new. So you you you're saying the balance is almost you've created an ad, but it's actually a cool ad. Like, I would like to know if it's going to be a White Walker that kills me, <laughs> or is it going to be Jon Snow? Well, <laughs> but he, also it's communicated clearly, and if he did, that's it with the key. The BuzzFeed News division would be a, a lot harder a balance to strike, right? Yeah, we never did it with news, so we did it with our entertainment division because the, the stakes there are about creative freedom and not about journalistic integrity. We covered BuzzFeed going public as a SPAC. Now the stock is down eighty five percent from that opening price. <laughs> What's the hardest thing about being a public company now versus private? How does it feel differently being, you know, when you were a startup, when you were a private company, and then now you got public investors in the public markets? I mean, as you know better than anyone, the public markets are have been pretty crazy over the last few years. It's different. It's like very... Any company that went public in 2021 is just down horrible shape. Yeah. And the, the, the SPAC market was red hot when we started our process and then was ice cold when we finished. So we, we essentially put our deal together and then we're like, oh, this, the SPAC market is, is terrible right now. <laughs> but we, we, we got to the other side of it mm-hmm. and we got public. Um, I think for any um, company, you know, you, you really can't judge yourself by your, your stock price. If you look at, you know, most of the companies I really admire in the last three years, their stock has varied, you know, mm-hmm. in many cases from, you know, you know, single digits to, you know, $80 a share or whatever, you know, yeah. these huge, huge swings. Um, but you can focus on the, on the long term and building a, a company. I think digital media is out of favor right now. SPACs are out of favor. Um, but the strong brands we have, the strong audience engagement we have, the diversified revenue we have, um, it's just for, you know, from my perspective, it's a matter of time before that, you know, we get credit for the value that we're, that we're building. I would say the only real downside of, of, of going public is that it was a distraction. And I say it in the past tense because, you know, most of what, of the, of the hard stuff, we are on the other side of now. One thing we saw you say was you've called millennials and Gen Z the most diverse, most online and most socially engaged generation the world has ever seen. We'd love to hear more about that because as the founder and CEO of BuzzFeed, you may know more about millennials than anyone else in the world. What we click on, what we share. Everything. <laughs> Everything about us. Are we ruining everything? Is that that's what we're getting? At. We Not ruin- just jagging me specifically, which may be the case. But as a generation, less at you thing, more we, at us thing. Yeah, we do see a lot. I mean, we do see a lot by reaching so many people. So you know, when the pandemic started, there was a a massive interest in our news coverage of the of the pandemic, and then there was a period where people were like oh, we don't want to read any more news about this. It's too depressing. And we saw lists and quizzes and entertainment, you know, surge. And then, you know, you remember there was a period where everyone wanted to learn how to bake bread and all the tasty content started oh. to, you know, do do, do well. Um, and and so, like, we, we are able to track a lot of the sort of trends that are happening in real time. Or when, you know, when people got their stimulus checks, um, we saw, you know, immediate increase in our commerce sales and in, in so you know. millennials are buying things. They're <laughs> yeah. baking bread. Yeah. They're looking for delight when they're pretty at home. proud of this generation, Jack. <laughs> is what I'm going to throw out there. We're very proud of it. They're fighting with the Gen Gen Z, but it's it's actually not not. That's like kind of a fake fake. You well, know, when you say we're the most socially engaged generation, is that a reference to the commenting and any you know online metrics engagement or? social activism kind of I thing. mean more social activism and and you know so you know on 
lots of different issues and really caring about, you know, um, so many different, different issues. And I think the, the way that algorithmic media allows people to cluster around interests has also caused people to cluster around, you know, f- like anime fandoms or celebrity fandoms or music genres, but also around activist um, causes that they, they believe in. And so the, the algorithmic structure of media has, has created this new kind of micro clustering of people that, um, that, that has influenced politics and activism in a big way. Jonah, looking ahead to BuzzFeed's future, we've said that good companies create great products, but great companies evolve. So how has BuzzFeed evolved in the last couple of years that have been totally unprecedented for media? And then where should it evolve going forward? Yeah, so one way we evolved was we realized that digital media companies needed to get bigger. And so we acquired HuffPost and Complex because there's just a lot of benefit of having a bigger platform. You know, so some of the things I talked about this interview that our commerce business, that took a lot to build it out, but now HuffPost can just inherit that because we bought them, you know, and, um, and there's a lot of examples of that from our ad platform to back, off, back office finance type, you know, and admin to- um, My econ you know, 101 professor would call this economies of scale, yes, right? Yes, there you go, there you go. You built um, a factory, which is your commerce division, and that thing better be running 100%. And so you got to get HuffPost content in there, complex in there as well. So, yeah, so that's one change. And that was because digital media got tougher in, in, in the past few years. And so you needed more efficiency. You needed to be able to operate better. You need, you know, so that was, you know, and you needed more diversified revenue, which favors bigger companies. So that was one. And then the other piece is the explosion of the creator economy. And that's a part of our business that's growing very quickly. And we're really solving this problem, which is independent creators, if you actually meet them in the real world and not just read about them, <laughs> in the, in the, they, they often are lonely, burnt out, working really hard, you know, and sometimes if they complain about being burnt out, their fans, you know, are like, but you, you, you know, how can you, you know, yeah. cancel them for saying they're burnt out when they're no obviously they're fabulous well, and like, no off days. they know. can also get canceled for achieving great success <laughs> because they're no longer like the relatable. True. Yeah, exactly. It's something that really, um, brings the best of both worlds from being an independent creator to having the benefit of a large media network and a brand. And so like some that. some brilliant chef who makes unbelievable one pot recipes, instead of posting on their own TikTok, they can post on BuzzFeed's TikTok? They can do both. They can, or they can come and do a show with us, which they never could make on their own because they, they don't have studios and they don't have, uh, you know, the resources to do it. Or they can come and collaborate with, with other creators and, and make things that, you know, you don't do if you're just hanging out in your apartment, you know, trying to crank out a video every day. But three years ago, we thought Quibi was going to be everything. Two years ago, TikTok was not kind of nothing. Now it's everything. <laughs> the media changes wicked fast. Um, what excites you about that and what scares you about that? I mean, we love change. It's what makes the job so fun. Uh, it, you know, if everything stayed the same, this would be not a very fun job. So you love the evolution. Yeah. Like finding, cracking new models, trying to figure out new formats, trying to figure out the new ways that, you know, media is going to work, media is going to evolve. And how do you reach people and have a big impact? That's the constant puzzle and energy to, to what we do. I mean, that's what excites us about media too, is we started out doing newsletters and we were like, yeah, newsletter, that's always our thing. We're also investing right now in a, a TikTok, TikTok production and TikTok could get banned. Yeah. So things shift all the time. Never knew we would be podcast hosts five years ago. Didn't really know that was a career option. And like now this is our our full life and we can't, we always want to do it. It's our everything, (laughs) Nick. Now you you talk in podcast voice at all times. Yeah, we're 110% of ourselves. Even with your family, even with your- We did greet greet Jonah with a couple microphones when he walked (laughs) Jonah, so, you know, we talked before about how your day looks different as a you know, a CEO of a public company versus a private one. Could you walk us through like what a morning looks like for you right now? <laughs> Who writes your presidential yeah. news briefing? And honestly, if it is simply making pancakes, we're totally satisfied with that answer. <laughs> and too. do you limit the presidential news briefing to one page with bullet points? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I do a lot of meeting with my team, which I think yeah. you'll give it is not a very yeah. interesting answer. But I also try to spend time using our products, using, you know, consuming media, yeah. um, trying to get a sense of, you know, talking to people who are, who are doing interesting things that are maybe, you know, 
20 degrees off of what we're doing to try to, uh, you know, under, understand it. A lot of the things that have opened up new possibilities for us have been at that frontline level, mm -hmm. like developing the tasty format or the quiz format or, um, you know, cracking the, the BuzzFeed shopping model. It's like all those things start with a small format that works or a piece of content that people love and engage with in a, in a deeper way. And so I think the key to, to being at least an entrepreneurial CEO or, or leader is to be able, the ability to, to go from the very ground level, what is the consumer doing, up to abstract ideas about the, you know, and system level ideas of like, what's the whole company's structure? And, and if you can't, you know, connect those two, then you end up with a cu culture where the leadership is out of touch and doesn't understand the things that are actually driving the business. But if you're only in the weeds, then you you can't operate a bigger company. You have created the the viral content um, from way back in the day. When was the last time you kind of published an article? Yeah, when, wait, actually, or do you sometimes <laughs> publish stuff under a pseudonym that we don't know that's happening? <laughs> Phone him already. Um, I mean, I worked I worked sometimes on a few little pet projects. Cool. You know, um, I got interested in some of the new um, new AI uh, image creation and video creation mm. stuff. So. I made a I made a video with my with my brother in law who's Jordan Peele the director um, about I still got to watch Nope about uh yeah it's great about uh, deep fakes <laughs> and so it's a, a PSA where he does uh, Is his, it funny? his Obama impression um, and that. he's <laughs> controlling Obama video of Obama it's in my head um, and basically making Obama say things he never would say in in real life. So I'm a we, Cubs fan. We kind of collaborated that. And then there was this AI soulmate uh, thing that we did, which was a BuzzFeed quiz where you <laughs> answer questions and it shows you a a totally fictitious person that is your wow. soulmate. Um, and that was one where I worked with, you know, a few of our, you know, team team members on that to to, to, to sort of oh, try to build a new- Answer a new, 10 questions and we'll create your artificial soulmate. <laughs> we'll recreate you. <laughs> <laughs> and you oh. get, yeah, you get, you end up with like a glitchy image of yeah. some like psychopath that you're supposed to like marry, you know? So it, it, it was designed, <laughs> it was designed to be uh, a little bit more like edgy and funny and weird. Um, and so um, that was, that was one I, I worked on a little bit. Jonah, BuzzFeed says it's the home of the best of the internet. We've talked in this conversation already about some great new vocabulary words that BuzzFeed's responsible for it. Oh, and totally. they are the best of the internet, like listicles and Disney quizzes, Disney princess quizzes, and, you know, one pot cooking videos. But the internet's also a dark place. And there's other vocabulary words like troll farms and deep fakes, which can be really scary. And what makes you hopeful about the internet? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's easy to be an optimist or a pessimist. A lot of it maybe is hardwired. I don't know. Uh, and I tend to be more of an optimist. But you're really asking at this point about what makes you optimistic about humans <laughs> because the internet is everywhere now. And so you're really talking about human nature when you're talking about, you know, do you believe in the internet and the future of the internet? Well, do you believe in humans and the future of, uh, of humans? Because um, so much of what people do is, is on the internet now. And so the distinction between life and the internet is 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 not you know that that big and so if you believe in humans and human creativity and ingenuity and ability to you know to to try to um, at least some people try to try to be heroic and fight against the bad things on the internet if you believe that that, that humans have that in, in us then I think you can be optimistic and I am I am optimistic um, but I think there's lots of challenges and we need to like be clear eyed about them and go after them and try to make the internet a better place. And that's one of the things that gets us up every day at, at BuzzFeed Inc. One thing that's had the biggest impact on all of us in, in this entire industry is really the tech platforms. So curious, you know, in that relationship between the two, media and tech, one kind of needs one, one kind of needs the other. And it's been this interesting dance Jack and I have always seen. When did the two find peace or do they ever find peace? Uh, I think there'll always be tension between tech and media. I try to be an ambassador between the two. I, I feel <laughs> I like I- sense that. I feel like I- I mean, you're such an look, internet optimist. You're bringing everyone to the table, potentially. I, I, I feel like I understand the, the, the worldview and the way that tech, the tech um, mm. founders think. And I am one of them in a, in a sense, um, in terms of how I think and my worldview. Um, but I also feel like I understand 
you know, creative people and media people and content people and feel like I'm one of them too. So I feel like I'm in some ways between these two worlds and that the most interesting creative things that get me the most excited merge tech and content and are when people push a medium further or do something using new technology that wasn't possible before. So if you were like, if you were like if a couple therapist. Game of, no, if he was a Game of Thrones character. Okay, talk to me. He'd be Jon Snow because he's oh, totally. a Targaryen and a Stark. Absolutely. A tech guy and... Uh, <laughs> but not the winter is coming dark Jon Snow. Definitely a much more optimistic <laughs> one. If you were to play like couples therapist between these two, between tech and media. So I'd be like, I'd have... Mark Zuckerberg and Rupert Murdoch yeah, sitting if, there and I'd be like, <laughs> how do we make your relationship better? Exactly, exactly. It just feels like you're not seeing eye to eye. <laughs> exactly. You're having a lot of communication problems. Totally. What would you say? <laughs> hey, Mark, this is what you got to understand. And hey, Rupert, here's what you got to understand about <laughs> tech. What would you say to the two? The biggest thing the media people, especially the older generation, don't get is that the world is not going back to something where there's the gatekeeping and power by a small number of people at the top of the masthead of a newspaper or, you know, who are running the cable network. And that the internet is inherently um, more democratic and is opening up more possibilities for people to have a voice and for people to get recognized and people to build careers. And, you know, your careers right now are possible because of the internet. And yeah, that's totally. a great thing. And, it's an incredible and, thing. And, and if you were slowly working your way up through, you know, Fox, you yeah. know, you know, News Corp or whatever, you know, that the would, Boston that would suck. And it's great that you can make this. And there's all these amazing things in the world because of, of the internet. Tech people, you know, need uh, to, to realize that there's also a lot of darkness in the, in the world and that a small number of really dedicated malicious bad actors can have a disproportionate effect on the experience of the mass public by, you know, harassing content, trolling content, racist content, um, you know, whether, you know, anti-vax content or, or misinformation. Um, and that the, the algorithmic structure of, of the platforms, the, the, the fact that the content is served up algorithmically favors more extreme content. A lot of people if you do surveys, say they don't want that content, but they still watch it. It's like the car car wreck effect or the rubbernecking effect, right? It's like these two sides are having crazy fights and battling. And you're like, I think both sides are dumb, but you're watching it because it's fascinating to see the battle and the fight and the wreckage and the carnage, right? And so, so and the algorithm is is essentially smashing all the cars into all each other, hover. you know, and the rest of us have to like gawk at all of it. I hover over a link and I'm like, I need to see what's under here, but I don't want to gratify them with my He's clicked on it, he's clicked on it, he's clicked on it. <laughs> two questions to go back and we can go back in time a little bit on this. One, a new employee gets to BuzzFeed. What are you telling that employee for their career? To be successful at BuzzFeed, to be successful anywhere. So many of our listeners are starting careers in the middle of careers. Where do you, how do you tell them to take advantage? What, what gets them to the next level? So just don't quiet quit. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's you, you never want to do that. You, you never want to do you that. Better yeah. not yeah. quiet fire them. Either. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, a lot of the advice depends on what kind of company you're joining, right? Mm -hmm. But that's, I think, the first thing. Join a company that you have overlap in your values and that you're excited about and that you believe in, even if it's a smaller company, even if it pays less, even if, you know, what you should find something that is a good fit for you that gets you passionate and gets you excited. Because if you do that long term, your career is going to be much better. And um, and don't waste those three years working in some job that, you know, where, you know, going into it that you kind of hate the company you're mm. signing up to work for. Like, That'd like life's too short for that. But people do that all the time. All right, Jonah, <laughs> before we let you go to hop over the Bay Bridge and go see your dad, because we don't want to get in the way of you and your dad. This show is called The Best One Yet. So Jack and I were talking before the show and we wanted to know what's your best ones yet? Got some rapid fire questions for you. We do. Jonah, what is the best slice of pizza yet? Single word, please. Zachary's, since I'm in, in in the Bay Area. What's the best book yet? I'll say Thinking Fast and Slow. The best business leader yet? Jeff Bezos. The best coffee yet? I like Stumptown. The best airport terminal yet? The new LaGuardia terminal with the uh, BuzzFeed store in it. Is that a native ad? Yeah, the best ad. performer yet? Prince. And the best podcast yet, that isn't the best one yet. 
Uh, my sister's podcast. I was telling you about it, but you know, the call in show. Call What's Chelsea call? Peretti. Call Chelsea Peretti. Okay. And you can but call she, in on the show. Yeah, but she, I don't think she's made one in like seven years. Or so, we'll no, we'll four just call years until or she picks up. We'll so this is like, she a, she's really got to bring it back. <laughs> this is. And finally, Jonah, at the end of every story, we like to know what the takeaway is. So there's one thing that we would like to hear you say before you leave us. What's the takeaway on BuzzFeed? BuzzFeed Inc. has these iconic brands, BuzzFeed, HuffPost, Complex, Tasty. And we're reaching um, the majority of millennials and Gen Z. And we're having a, a great time really uh, building a media company for the future. And Jonah, as Jonah Peretti, what is the takeaway on Jonah Peretti of BuzzFeed? <laughs> <laughs> the takeaway for me? Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll eat that burrito you got and go see my dad and, you know, have a nice rest of the day in the Bay Area. And then finally, well, Jonah, if we had to get a Uncut Gems moment, what should that Uncut Gems moment be with we you? We need for this, this episode to go viral. If we want this podcast and this episode to go viral, how do we pull it off? It's too late now, but okay. you should have asked me some really controversial question and got me to slip up and say something that would, you know, well, you're welcome. get me get me like canceled or fired or some, you know, in some way. Well, we do love your slamming salmon shirt. We got to say. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>